All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to lessons from RLHF on the difficulties of aligning advanced AI. Uh, that acronym, RLHF, as many of you may know, stands for Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback. Uh, and it has recently emerged as the central alignment technique for aligning the cutting edge systems of today, like GPT-4, Claude 2, BARD, Llama 2. Uh, but RLHF has a number of known problems, and these systems have already exhibited several troubling alignment failures. Uh, and so we might ask, you know, how did we get here? What lessons should we learn? What does this mean for the future of AI systems? Uh, and we're very lucky today to be joined by Stephen Casper to help us talk through some of those questions. Um, Stephen, also known as Cass, is in his third year over at MIT across the river um, in a computer science PhD in the Algorithmic Alignment Group, uh, led by Dylan hadfield Bunnell. Formerly, he has worked with the Harvard Kryman Lab and the Center for Human Compatible AI, and his main focus is on interpreting, diagnosing, debugging, and auditing deep learning systems. Um, so Stephen will just be here in a minute, but before he comes up, I want to remind you to open up your Swapcart app right now, uh, and you can have it open during the session as you think of questions. Uh, go ahead and over to the question tab um, from the chat tab and write those in there, and then you can also look through other questions people have asked and upload the ones that you're most curious about. So when we get to the q and I'm asking the ones that uh, people most want to know about first. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Cass. Thanks, Eric. All right, so uh, thanks, Eric, and I'm really glad to be here. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, like you said, my name's Cass, and you can usually find me at MIT, and I work on RLHF, and I'm really fortunate to work with a lot of talented people, including a lot of co-authors that are listed at the bottom of the slide. And just maybe for my sake, if nothing else, I am a bit curious about like why everyone's here. Uh, could everyone in the audience like maybe raise your hand uh, if you're interested in or you work on like technical AI topics, like you do a lot of coding with neural nets or something? And could people also raise your hand if you have some interest or if you have some involvement with like AI governance and policy? Okay, I think that's pretty exciting. I think there's a good balance, and I hope that there's a bit in this presentation for everyone here. So um, I'm fortunate to work on RLHF. I think it's a really interesting topic. And I want to focus today on kind of the story, uh, a certain story of how we got to where we are with the state of the art in AI right now, uh, through the lens of reinforcement learning hu from human feedback, because it's the state of the art technique for aligning today's AI systems. And I want to begin this story actually with an event that happened uh, just earlier this week. So there were a lot of academic types um, who wrote a kind of article slash letter that you can find online. Uh, and this came out earlier this week, and it's titled Managing AI Risks in an Era of Rapid Progress. And I think it's an excellent piece of writing. I think it does a really good job of laying out the case for safety and caution uh, moving forward, given where we are right now. And um, one thing I want to highlight from the article is just the very first sentence, which I found particularly disarming when I read it. This is something that I kind of, it's pretty easy to forget. Um, but the first sentence of this article is that in 2019, GPT-2 could not reliably count to 10. And I think this makes four years ago seem like a really, really long time ago. It's something that's kind of easy to forget, uh, just how far we've come in just such a short time. And even one year ago, I think, seems like a pretty long time ago. In October of 2022, we did not have uh, chat GPT. Chatbots were not the kind of dynasty of state-of-the-art AI. We were just using regular text models. And um, in less than a year, since this came out in November of last year, we've kind of come to where we are today, where um, all of these text uh, models that are uh, available in chat applications are kind of the state of the art. They're really impressive assistants in a lot of tasks. Even my dad is really familiar with using something like ChatGPT to help accomplish a lot of tasks. And today, where, we're now, where we are now, um, there's this perspective that's kind of becoming increasingly popular that we might be kind of on the dawn of the age of artificial general intelligence. Uh, this isn't even particularly recent. Uh, in the spring, there was a paper put out by some folks at Microsoft AI titled uh, Sparks of Artificial and General Intelligence, Early Experiments with GPT-4. And they remark, that given the breadth and depth of GPT-4's capabilities, we believe that it could reasonably be viewed as an early yet still incomplete version of an artificial general intelligence or an AGI system. Today's chatbots 
might be one of our last best chances to study alignment failures before the stakes get higher, the applications get more safety critical, and uh, the risks increase in the future. So the goal that, of today, and the thing that I want to kind of convey or I want you to take away, is an understanding of the algorithmic story behind how we got here through the lens of RLHF, including uh, the key events, but also some of the just key choices that kind of uh, got us to where we are, which might suggest some info about where we're going next. So what is RLHF? Uh, even if you don't know about it, by the end of this presentation, you'll have a pretty good idea of what it all, what, what's going on. It's actually a pretty simple set of like interconnected technical machine learning processes. Nothing should be intimidating about this. It's, a, it's not a crazy process. Uh, the key steps behind RLHF all begin with some sort of pre-trained or initialized model. And it's a pretty general technique. You can use it to train all sorts of different AI systems, one that like do robotic control, ones that uh, generate text like uh, lots of the state-of-the-art systems do. So you'll begin with what's called a policy or some sort of action selector that like um, outputs actions for a robot or outputs text for a conversation. And with this pre-trained or randomly initialized model, you'll have it produce just a bunch of examples, like a bunch of rollouts in a, uh, a state space or a bunch of conversations. And you'll simply give those to humans. And that's the first step in the left on the green. And when you give these to humans, you ask the humans to annotate them with feedback in some modality, where they just give some sort of information in some sort of form about how desirable certain actions or how desirable certain um, rollouts end up being. And the purpose of this step is to just construct kind of a labeled data set with examples and metadata. And then you'll give this to what is called a reward model and do kind of the classic machine learning thing, or you'll trade this re train this reward model on this data set in order to reflect or serve as a proxy for human judgments. That's the middle step in blue. Uh, and then the final step is to update your original model, your policy, using a process of reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is just one of the ways that machine learners will train AI systems. Um, reinforcement learning algorithms are all just some sort of formalized process of trial and error. And then you can repeat this step. You can gather more examples, get more labels on them, update your reward model, and update your policy um, iteratively over and over again. And that's it. This is the simple type of like major algorithmic approach from a high level that's used to make today's state of the art AI. And notably, it's not particularly complicated. And as you might guess, you know, all the individual components of this have been researched for a pretty long time. Uh, how long exactly? Uh, these things go way back, uh, well before I was born, for example. Um, one uh, notable event that happened in the, at the beginning of the 90s, there's a cool paper called A Research Agenda for the 90s in Human-Computer Interaction. And this uh, was kind of a notable landmark in the history here because it helped to start laying out some of the problems and challenges that we're actually still handling and facing in various like, ways and modalities today. Um, in 1990, uh, concerning reinforcement learning, the field was maturing enough by then so that there was a textbook written that is still a really standard one albeit a future edition, that's used in lots of like courses today. Like I've used this textbook before. Um, by the mid-2000s, you had versions of RLHF actually starting to like be used. Uh, there's one framework known as Tamer. And for all you reinforcement learning people in the audience, you might find it funny, because I do, that this is so old that they didn't even call a policy a policy. They just called it an action selector, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, also around the mid-2000s, there was a lot of attention kind of brought up behind methods to infer information about human goals and values and desires from their behavior. And the Netflix challenge was one particularly notable uh, event uh, in the mid-2000s here. And then by 2017, uh, the field around preference-based reinforcement learning had kind of matured enough so that there was a survey paper, uh, the Worth Survey it's sometimes called, that uh, did a pretty good job of like um, mapping out the space, which had become uh, pretty diverse and interesting at that point. And then fast forwarding to earlier this year, and the reason I'm here is that uh, I was able to work with 31 co-authors on a paper titled Open Problems and Fundamental Limitations of Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback, where we kind of do our best to uh, give the most thorough and comprehensive outline that we possibly can for all of the open, um, all of the issues and the problems that our LHF is facing today. And despite all of this, you know, things going back a long time in the history of our LHF and the history of our LHF still actively being written, there was one pretty notable event that happened in 2017, and that's the Cristiano et al. paper. Um, if I put this paper uh, heading up on the slide, it's called Deep Reinforcement Learning from Human Preferences. Uh, has anyone seen this before? 
Are you familiar with this paper? Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's been pretty influential and pretty well known and pretty well received. Uh, the main thing that was done here was learning a, to do a backflip from about a thousand human labels. And the system that was learning to do this backflip was a simple um, agent in a simulated physics environment doing a robotics control type task. And this is what that looks like. That's it. If you're kind of not impressed by this, it's because you're a human from 2023 and you're too desensitized to <laughs> just how hard some sort of tasks are, right? You probably see like screenshots of people doing amazing things with ChatGPT like every day. But I promise back in 2017, everyone went really wild over this because despite decades of research into lots of these methods, up until 2017, when OpenAI threw a lot of money and talent and time and compute at this, no one had ever gotten something like this to happen. And this event in 2017 kind of spurred a lot of interest around what could really be done um, with reinforcement learning from human feedback in practical applications. And you might know, you might be able to predict what I'm saying next. It didn't take people very long to figure out that you could do some interesting things with language models. Uh, the papers on this from OpenAI started uh, popping up about less than, less than two years later. And here's another algorithmic overview of what's going on but with a few more details than a few slides ago. So the human feedback step when doing RLHF on uh, language models tends to involve a form of feedback from binary comparisons. So a human is shown like two conversations in the case of a chatbot, and they're just asked to say whether conversation A or B was better, and they'll select one, A or B. And you'll collect a labeled data set like this of pairs with uh, preference labels. You'll, then you'll train a reward model using the simple principle that the reward model is supposed to output a high reward estimate for the conversations that were marked better and a low reward estimate for the conversations that were marked worse. And then finally, you will uh, update the policy, in this case, a language model or a chatbot with uh, reinforcement learning yet again. And this simple process is the key behind state-of-the-art applications of RLHF. You've probably heard of ChatGPT, which is based on GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. Uh, Google's BARD is another one of these examples. Uh, Anthropics Claude 2 and Llama 2 from Meta are uh, other notable uh, state-of-the-art chatbots that are trained with RLHF. And these systems are kind of, and a few ones that are very similar are kind of recognized to be, um, you know, the, the modern regime of uh, aligned AI systems. They represent the state-of-the-art. And they now have user bases, and probably including uh, most or everyone in the audience, that uh, are well into the hundreds of millions, if not the billions by now. And this is really impressive. We've made a lot of really cool progress in, all, in very little time. But uh, as you might expect, there are some challenges that have kind of emerged uh, post-deployment of these models. Uh, they've exhibited a lot of unforeseen issues. So please excuse me for just ripping an entire paragraph from uh, the paper that I mentioned earlier. Um, but RLHF trained LLMs, the ones shown on the previous slide, have revealed sensitive private information. They have hallucinated untrue content. They've spread biases that favor specific political ideologies. They've exhibited sycophantic responses, expressed undesirable preferences like not wanting to be shut down. They've been easy to misalign by fine tuning on as few as 10 new examples. And uh, they've been vulnerable to jailbreaks or other types of attacks. Uh, attacks. And all of these problems are not just things that like surfaced with GPT 3.5 and then like quickly got patched or got fixed with GPT 4. There's still an ongoing uh, kind of arms race of finding problems and fixing them uh, in, a, in a sort of cycle, as tends to happen in like various uh, uh, subfields of the machine learning literature involving attacks and weaknesses. Uh, for example, a couple months ago, there was a pretty uh, interesting and well-received paper uh, finding universal and transferable uh, adversarial prompts that worked for all four of the models mentioned on the previous slide. And um, another recent development with these models has been the incorporation of um, uh, their ability to uh, take images as input into the APIs that users can use them with. So, uh, for example, it's, becoming, it's starting to become common for people to do interesting things with like ChatGPT by giving it images as input. And one potential hazard with this is that it increases the possible set of failure modes or the possible attack surface. And given some recent work and uh, everyone's intuition on this, one thing that a lot of people are predicting is that we're going to start seeing a lot, new a lot of new failure modes um, that kind of come to light involving the multimodality of these models via the image modality for the inputs. And 
there are probably lots of us are aware if you spend the, enough time on the right parts of the internet where people are talking about these things, the kind of new challenges roll out more than on a weekly basis, right? It's pretty common to see like someone's screenshot of some sort of failure that they found. And uh, we sh can probably expect this to continue. And the fact that we've seen a string of unintended failures like this suggests that maybe things proceeded a bit too quickly. And there are two points that I want to make here. And they kind of seem roughly in opposition in spirit, but I think they're actually very complementary. So the first thing I want to note is that finding all of these failures is a really, really, really good thing, like unambiguously. Um, for example, put yourself in the shoes of a company like OpenAI. So one of the bad types of things that a system like ChatGPT can do is it can be kind of like prompted or attacked or goaded into saying like offensive things sometimes. Like it'll say something mean or it'll use bad words, uh, et cetera. It just does something unsavory. And for lots of these uh, types of failures, it would be pretty trivial to prevent them from happening. If you're OpenAI, all you would need to go do if you really, really wanted security against these failures is to pull some sort of pre-trained harmful text identifier off the shelf, just some sort of classifier for that, and then use that classifier as a filter for the outputs of ChatGPT, or and like regenerate a response whenever something is uh, flagged as um, offensive. And then that's it. And many of the, these types of failures would just never happen or never see the light of day. And there are some technical details here, but at least it would be very straightforward to kind of make the system safer in some sense using this strategy. But openly, uh, uh, notably, OpenAI has chosen not to do this, right? And this is the right choice because you know, we're learning from all of these failures when they, when they crop up. Um, it's bad when chat models fail, right? We, we don't want this to happen, and some bad things can happen sometimes. They can give bad info. Uh, they can um, uh, showcase bi biases that are harmful. But you know, these are uh, problems that we're going to endure. You know, they're not society's biggest issues. If these were the worst things that could happen with AI systems, lots of us could kind of breathe a sigh of relief, and maybe many of, many of us could go work on um, some other cause area. Right? And this is one of the things I meant earlier when I said that chat bottles might be our, one of our last best chances to study alignment failures before the stakes get too high. So while it's a good thing that we've been able to observe all these failures, it's still a pretty concerning sign. right? Because companies releasing models um, like uh, the Fora from a few slides ago have put a lot of engineering work and compute and effort into making sure that those failures never happened in the first place, right? Something that OpenAI in particular touted or was very proud of upon its release of GPT-4, and something that they responded to criticism with was the fact that they had spent six months of work on doing evals and red teaming and patching. And we can fully expect that during this process they were finding a lot of problems and they were fixing them, and there were probably many, many issues with these chatbots that never ever saw the light of day because of good and due diligence from these, uh, the AI companies producing them. Yet still, we have failure after failure. And this, uh, that were unforeseen and unintended. You know, these things escaped these companies' best uh, attempts to avoid them in the first place. So the fact that we're seeing such a string of unintended failures might suggest that maybe things are proceeding a bit too quickly, or maybe we should be cautious in the future. Because if we ever have super intelligent AI, sooner or later or whenever, hopefully it doesn't go this way, right? We don't want to deploy systems and then experience failure after failure when the AI is smarter, when the applications are more safety critical, and when the stakes are higher. And I think observing all of these things and you know, society becoming collectively much more aware of these types of problems um, has led to a lot of sympathy for um, people warning about X risk. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, the uh, AI extinction letter that was put out earlier this year was so timely and uh, arguably so much more well-received than it might have been a year ago. A lot of AI scientists and other notable figures in and around the field um, argued that mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. Um, probably lots of you are familiar with this letter or you've read it uh, if you haven't already. And there's a certain sense in which maybe things really didn't need to go this way. Uh, maybe we didn't need to make these mistakes and learn these lessons via mis these mistakes as fast as we should have. Um, maybe RLH, well, RLHF was actually never really intended as a solution for AI alignment. Uh, and that's a pretty uh, notable thing to, to take note of, 
given how it's the state of the art for AI alignment, right? For example, uh, Paul Cristiano, uh, who many people here are probably pretty familiar with, uh, he's a really talented uh, research scientist at ARC, and he was the first author of that Cristiano et al. paper, the, the one with the robot doing the backflip. Uh, in January of this year, he put out a blog post called Thoughts on the Impact of RLHF Research, where he reflects on the story and he weighs a bunch of pros and cons. And there are legitimate pros and cons, right? And Paul acknowledges this. And ultimately, uh, it's important to note that he concludes somewhat cautiously that he thinks lots of the impacts of this research are net positive because of the um, lessons that we're able to learn. And I think he's uh, very likely to be, uh, you know, presciently right about this. But something really important that Paul uh, uh, wrote and something that impressed on me a little bit was that I think it's hard to productively work on more challenging alignment problems without first implementing basic solutions. So much of the route to arguing about uh, RLHF's potential net positivity comes through acknowledging that RLHF itself is just something to learn lessons from. It was never intended as the, the uh, solution for robust AI alignment. Uh, this next slide is a little bit of a footnote, actually, so I'll just digress very briefly. Uh, if it's not RLHF, what might be the solution uh, for developing robustly uh, aligned and safe AI? Uh, if you're interested in this question, uh, the answers that people are talking about include techniques like recursive reward modeling and uh, things like debate. And it's a little bit dated, it's from 2020, but there's a paper called An Overview of 11 Proposals for Building Safe Advanced AI uh, that you could go check out. And to claim that RLHF like, is obviously not a robust solution for AI alignment and is not thought of as a robust solution for AI alignment is not a controversial claim. Uh, I think it's pretty notable that OpenAI has also like, openly acknowledged this. Uh, they wrote in their super alignment agenda announcement a bit earlier this year, our current techniques for aligning AI, such as reinforcement learning from human feedback, rely on humans' ability to supervise AI but humans won't be able to reliably supervise AI systems much smarter than us. And I think this is pretty interesting, right? Everyone, including OpenAI, like the maker of these systems, really pretty much agrees. There's consensus that like RLHF is not our best bet, at least in theory, at solving the alignment problem. But that seems a little bit incongruous with how it's still the state of the art for solving alignment, right? And maybe, we never really needed to make RLHF the public experiment that it has become on the scale that it has been deployed on. And maybe we never really needed um, to catalyze the rapid uh, development and investment and hype and excitement about um, AI capabilities progress um, the way that we have. One of my co-authors described a potential perverse dynamic behind some of these developments as a capabilities capture. And he made the observation that RLHF's effects on advancing capabilities have become, today, much, much more prominent than its overall impacts on AI safety. Which is something I think it's important to take note of, right? Because of, of RLHF's uh, recent, like, uh, very notable effects on like how much excitement and investment is going into AI capabilities progress because of uh, the recent excitement around applications uh, that are very powerful. And I want to be clear that I'm not trying to make any sort of uh, claims about like Paul being wrong about something or OpenAI being wrong about something or any other person or any other um, company. I don't think it's soon enough to like really make claims like this and I think if I did have a well-formed opinion on the matter I probably wouldn't share it anyway. But one thing that I am pretty confident about, and which I want to talk about a bit next, is that we definitely have a lot more lessons to learn uh, from RLHF. Remember that this story with um, today's state-of-the-art uh, AI has been playing out for less than a year, uh, the chatbot regime, that is. And uh, acknowledging that we have more lessons to learn was one of the main motivations behind 31 other co-authors and I when we went to write the Open Problems and Fundamental Limitations paper. And most of the paper actually just focuses on like outlining different flaws and challenges and, and things that we uh, need to be addressing with this. And despite being most of the paper, it's just gonna be one slide that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on. Um, just like the algorithmic components of RLHF can be split up into human feedback, the reward model, and the policy, uh, the problems with RLHF can also be split up this way, and we do so. And uh, notably, there are a good number of them. 
And lots of these problems are actually relatively old machine learning problems because lots of the components of RLHF are relatively old machine learning techniques that have been researched and been, have been around for a while. Um, if I went into any of the details here, I would really, really, really quickly be getting in weeds of things, so I'm not gonna do that. But instead, I wanna focus on some of the higher level observations that we are able to kind of uh, make as a set of authors about you know, what some of these problems might mean or what they might be indicative of. For example, one thing that we observed is that there are like three types of challenges, or one way of viewing the challenges with RLHF is, is falling into three particular types. One of these are just tractable RLHF challenges, uh, things that you can probably address within the framework. For example, selecting and training human evaluators. This is a task that is actually really hard. I don't want to understate the fact that it's really hard by calling it tractable because it's not an easy feat to uh, go and select demographically representative human evaluators to train them really well and to make sure that they are um, really attentive and they're uh, ben benevolent and aligned and doing exactly the right thing. And arguably, no like company's setup with some sort of big, large-scale RLHF run has actually solved this problem before. Um, but it's at least a problem that we can start to make progress on by just improving things and maybe taking longer and spending more money on these processes. Um, well, this is something we can like, address within the framework, you might say. Contrast that with fundamental RLHF challenges. These are things that we can't address within the framework of RLHF, and addressing them would require some sort of technique to supplement or replace parts of RLHF that would no longer make it something that is you know, RLHF. An example of this is the problem that OpenAI pointed out in the quote that I had a few slides ago. The problem that humans can't supervise superhuman models with any sort of reliability or guarantees, right? And there are ways of trying to get around this problem, you know, like I mentioned, recursive reward alignment, uh, recursive reward modeling or debate. But um, those kind of would uh, take us a little bit outside of the RLHF framework. And there's a third type of challenge with RLHF, and these are also fundamental challenges with RLHF, but just alignment challenges, ones that you're not really going to be able to get around with improved methodology. And the notable one here is the fact that, you know, alignment itself is a somewhat perverse idea if it's kind of like the target, right? Uh, it's really important that we work on AI alignment, but that solving AI alignment or doing it pretty well in some particular application doesn't guarantee at all that we are um, aligning to the interests of the world as a whole. An AI system being aligned to its user obviously doesn't mean it's aligned to everyone. And this is a problem that we've probably all heard a lot of like discussion about. Uh, you know, who's making these choices? Whose values are inside of the AI system? And unfortunately, there's no like, technical problem to be solved here. Right? They're just choices to be made. And when choices are made about who the AI is aligned to and who it represents, uh, they're just going to be consequences to be lived with. And unfortunately, some of the people living with those consequences are not going to be the, um, uh, the technocrats making these choices. Another high-level observation that we make about some of the challenges with AI alignment is that they're very, very old and relatively, some of them are even just boring and uninteresting. We actually got some reviews back on the paper recently. Um, and without going into too much detail, I'll comment that one reviewer just said that, you know, why are you talking about this particular challenge? It's been known about forever. This is a problem with ML, not a problem with uh, RLHF. And this reviewer was right in a certain sense because uh, you know, despite RLHF's capabilities being like, you know, newly understood to be powerful, and despite the applications being so like new and interesting, uh, and the new scale at which uh, models are trained being, being really revolutionary, the approaches themselves are pretty old, right? Um, and for a little while, we decided it would be too subversive, but we were actually considering a title of the paper uh, we were actually considering calling it rehashing lessons from historical failures to kind of emphasize the point that the algorithmic components behind RLHF are really, really old, and they've been understood to have problems for a long time. Uh, yet, it's still the state of the art for training advanced AI systems. So what do we do? We're not just like cynical. Uh, we do our best to talk about uh, the rich research space like surrounding RLHF and what we can do to solve uh, particular problems that arise with it. Right? Just like there are algorithmic components and challenges that can be divided by the, uh, whether they involve human feedback, the reward model, or the policy, uh, there are also uh, different solutions to some of the uh, uh, issues that we've observed, at least the addressable ones. 
and uh, we uh, survey those as well. And if you want to talk with me about this or email with me about any, uh, email me about any of these things, I'd really love to talk some more. But this is another thing that I'm going to like rapidly blow through uh, in order to focus on the high-level story as opposed to the technical details. Okay, what about governance, right? One thing that all 32 co-authors, um, I was even a little bit surprised, but all 32 co-authors kind of agreed on is that one of the principles behind having healthy norms in the research and development ecosystem and having healthy expectations and um, uh, effective policies would be increased transparency and increased accountability. So we enumerate a lot of things that it would be really, really great if AI companies doing large-scale RLHF runs to uh, train state-of-the-art AI systems It'd be things that would be really, really great for them to disclose that could be indicative of certain shortcuts or risks or negligence on their part. And they include uh, details about collecting human feedback, details about training the world model, and details about the policy, as well as systemic safety um, uh, measures that are taken within, inside, uh, within the company itself. And there are three particular reasons that we think it would be very valuable to have uh, more accountability and more transparency here. One is the obvious. Uh, it makes it easier to catch problems when they arise and understand those problems. Uh, two is that it can cre creates better incentives. If there's an expectation for companies to be more transparent, this uh, creates an incentives for them to make sure that like, their process itself is like one that's good and they're not sweeping much under the rug. And the third, which I also want to put a lot of emphasis on, is that this helps the research and academic communities also kind of track RLHF's progress and its challenges. And I think there's actually a really uh, good case in point here that comes from the case study that maybe many of us know about um, involving Bing Chat. Uh, so Microsoft, which works closely with OpenAI earlier this year, or it, it might have been late last year, but they um, released Bing Chat, which was this uh, GPT-based uh, chat assistant that you could use with Bing. And pretty quickly, uh, people found there were some like very concerning problems with it including literally threatening users and finding out information about them, uh, which is a bit kind of like terrifying. Probably the best example we have of like scary, aggressive misalignment to date comes from Bing Chat. And uh, these problems were addressed. I think there are many fewer concerns with Bing Chat that there were before. However, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no like detailed public report about what the details of the failures were here and what institutional decisions were made that contributed to this and what technical choices were made that contributed to this. But I think we can all agree that it would be really, really valuable as a, an alignment community to have a better understanding of why Bing Chat failed the way it did, uh, and especially in light of how some of uh, other peer language models to it uh, didn't quite uh, fail the way that they did. There are other questions in governance too. One sort of obvious one, and uh, even though it's, this is kind of a generic point that I'm making, I still think it's one to like, talk about because it's pretty important, is this issue of like, money and power, right? Uh, McKinsey Digital estimates that generative AI could add the equivalent of 2.6 trillion to 4.4 trillion annually uh, across 63 use cases that they analyzed. And this is on par with the GDP of the United Kingdom. And you know, of course, there are people in the AI alignment and safety community who think that this could probably be way higher. And with the automation of useful uh, services tends to come the, the concentration and isolation of power, right? And something that we as a society definitely like don't want is for an outcome of uh, advanced systems trained with RLHF today to lead to uh, the, an immense concentration of power and money into the hands of a few people, especially if that also incidentally leads to something like regulatory capture. So this is something uh, governments need to be uh, really vigilant about as well. And we as a society kind of like need to work on uh, uh, addressing, try to, try to make sure that benefits and harms are more equitably distributed. Uh, somewhat relatedly is a social justice angle. Uh, you know, the governance problems uh, get deeper, actually. So many of you may have even seen this particular article from earlier this year, uh, from Time, about uh, un uncovering a story in which OpenAI used Kenyan uh, knowledge workers and ended up paying them less than $2 per hour to make ChatGPT less toxic. And uh, after this article had come out, you know, people said, like the conversation that sparked around this article was about what you'd expect it to be. People are like, they're, they're being underpaid, they're being demographically targeted, what's going on? Um, but actually in July, uh, there was a much more, there were much more started to be learned about this particular case study actually. And I think there's some, it's, it's worth going into a little bit in depth what kind of happened here. 
So in July, I'm referring to a, a podcast episode which has a transcript, so it's basically an article online. And it's titled, The Hidden Workforce That Helped Filter Violence and Abuse Out of ChatGPT. And uh, this was put together by Wall Street Journal's Karen Howe. And it kind of gives some details about like, um, why OpenAI did what it did and what impacts this had on the, no the cohort of Kenyan knowledge workers that were behind this. So why were they selected? Uh, Kenya is a low-income country. This is uh, from the transcript. And it has a very high unemployment rate. Wages are really low, which is very attractive to tech companies that are trying to increase their profit margins. And it's also a highly educated workforce that speaks English because of colonization and there's good Wi-Fi infrastructure. So in addition to the way that this like, cohort of knowledge workers was kind of targeted, and the, in addition to the reasons why OpenAI used them to uh, do content moderation, um, this article slash transcript goes in to talk more about the effects that this type of content moderation had on the knowledge workers in question here, right? Um, and I had in an earlier draft of this presentation, like a few other slides with some more text like this, uh, and a content warning and a lot of redacted text just to make sure that everything was like good to show in front of an audience. And it got really messy really quickly. So at the same time as I'll encourage you to go kind of look at this transcript if you're interested, it, interested I'll uh, give, do my best job to like summarize uh, kind of what was discussed. So these knowledge workers, as you might imagine, like had to do a lot of content moderation on some very like disturbing types of content in order to make sure that a system like ChatGPT is safe and not prone to failures involving you know, outputting bad things it might have learned from the internet and pre-training, uh, there needs to be a lot of data involved uh, with you know, horrible types of text. In order to make sure this never happens, you need examples of horrible text to make sure that the reward model knows that text is horrible, to make sure that the policy is, and is trained to never output that type of text in RLHF, right? So uh, these Kenyan knowledge workers had to um, annotate data involving things that are about as bad as you might care to imagine, including a lot of uh, graphic uh, textual depictions of sexual violence. And they did this day in and day out like quite a lot. And as you might imagine, like put yourself in this position, if you had to like look at that type of stuff repeatedly, you'd probably be kind of upset or it would probably make you kind of sad or disturbed. And predictably, this kind of had this effect on a lot of these Kenyan knowledge workers. And this transcript goes on to talk about like how, including quotes from these knowledge workers, about how it affected their ability to sleep, uh, their happiness like day in and day out, their feelings of fear with interacting with people around them, and their ability to like have positive, safe interactions, uh, like happy interactions with their family. And uh, some of them were emphatic about how they really regret being part of this cohort because it just like wasn't worth it to them. And so here we have an instance in which OpenAI, which is a very wealthy company, had some like dirty work to do, right? And they outsourced this dirty work by targeting a demographic of people in a developing country overseas who were poor they exposed them uh, over and over again to um, disturbing types of text, and which predictably had uh, distressing impacts on them and caused many of them to you know, confidently regret their decision to participate in this cohort. And I wanna be clear that um, like OpenAI is not a monolith, right? Uh, I think they acknowledge internally that this is a mistake. There is no evidence that they're continuing this kind of practice right now, right? Uh, but this was a mistake and it was made somehow and there was an institution that is supposed to like, you know, be one that we trust and have confidence in that was behind uh, this, this incident here. And I think what we need to learn from this is that companies like OpenAI, like Anthropic is included in this group too, you know, have these very ambitious and benevolent goals of like making the development of future AI go as positively as possible and to try to ensure that like, humanity benefits uh, as much as possible from these uh, new technologies and new opportunities that, open it, that AI is going to um, uh, make available to us. And I believe that this is sincere, and we all hope that they're very successful in this ambition, right? But in instances in which their mouth is doing something different from their hands, or under the table, uh, these companies are um, doing some kind of shady, shady things that really notably diverge from the goal of making sure that uh, AI benefits humans across the entire world. In cases like this, we really need to be vigilant and kind of demand accountability. 
And it's an important problem for our community and for governance to kind of think about what sort of like cultures and what sort of um, uh, policies uh, can help to ensure more transparency and accountability here. Because it probably won't happen by default. There's no evidence that OpenAI is continuing this type of work, but I'm also not aware of any type of public explanation or apology for this particular mistake that they made. So where does that leave us? Uh, I'll wrap things up uh, in just a second, actually. I find that the more I like, study RLHF, including like, the context behind the way that all this research is done, the more uncertain I actually feel about whether some of the decisions were actually like, net positive or net negative. So um, I can't, fortunately, like, unfortunately, I can't come up here and confidently say that some X should have been done or Y should have been done from, uh, you know, when thinking about the overall story regarding technical progress. Um, but I do want to kind of like close with a few things that I do feel relatively confident about and that I want to offer as like food for thought for each of you. Uh, one thing is that RLHF unambiguously like was never intended as the solution for robust AI alignment. But interestingly, it's still the state of the art for AI alignment anyway. And this is arguably due to a capabilities capture, and it's probably not going to be the last capabilities capture that we witness. Another important takeaway is that RLHF has exhibited a lot of failures, and these failures have been great in one sense that they have taught us a lot. However, the flip side of the coin is that we still have a lot more to learn from these failures, and we can't afford to make so many mistakes in the future as the AI gets smarter and the stakes get higher. If we have super intelligence, we had better hope that its rollout and introduction to the world does not go the same way that today's RLHF LLMs have gone. So maybe like the last thing I'd like to uh, close with and leave everyone with is uh, this perspective that I think it's really, really valuable to kind of look at the decisions and technical um, events and some in some cases just choices that have kind of led us to where we are. This is all kind of a message uh, that al lines up with the cliche, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And uh, you know what happens when we possibly might in the future start to see some of the same patterns or events unfold? And um, what happens if we end up observing that we're rehashing certain lessons from uh, technical failures and also just kind of like failures of uh, humanity things that go back uh, really uh, long into the past where people are maybe like less concerned about outgroups. So uh, I think we need to be really vigilant about this and I hope that our community does the best to make sure that we're not, uh, that RLHF doesn't become a lesson about rehashing lessons from historical failures. Thanks. Cass, thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Um, so a reminder, uh, we have about 15 minutes now for some Q&A, so pop up and swap card if you want to participate. You can add your questions or just upvote the ones that you're most curious to hear about. Um, and don't worry, after that, there's still more time to interact with Cass. Uh, there'll be office hours right after this session in room 308, which is just out that way. Um, but uh, yeah, Cass, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we had a number of questions. I think I'll just jump right into some questions from the audience. Sounds we have great. a little bit of time. Um, that we're sort of pointing out, it can be hard to figure out how to carve distinctions here between you know, what is a failure of RLHF, what is a failure of the underlying model, uh, what is even like a failure of, of humanity, for example. Um, so I, I wanna throw a question at you from, from Nikki in particular, uh, who says, if you want to use RLHF to say, like remove bias from a chatbot or some other undesirable feature, given that the vast majority of, of training time is spent on this like underlying next token prediction task, um, how can we say that RLHF could overcome this bias without training against the reward model for an amount of time that's comparable to the pre-training step? Um, it sort of feels like maybe RLHF is only going to ever be a Band-Aid on a more like fundamentally flawed training technique with the, with the base model. Yeah, I think this is a pretty cons a big concern. Like, obviously, we know uh, we have a lot of instances um, in which we're making observations that like today's chatbots, say the state of the art ones, like have these undesirable biases. Uh, one big source of this is from pre-training, right? Because models are just pre-trained on in in internet text. And thankfully, that internet text is like curated somewhat, but it's internet text. We all know what the internet, like we all know how the internet is, and there are lots of like um, uh, biases, including ones about like demographic groups that are kind of you know, latent in this text, and these, the pre-trained models pick up on that. And um, the reason you pre-train models is because of how much knowledge you can stuff into them through an extended pre-training process. And um, 
Uh, for the same reason that we pre-train, uh, the biases from pre-training still make it into the fine-tuned models. And then we have this fine-tuning process, which um, you know, doesn't rewrite everything. You know, it, doesn't, um, it adapts the model, but it doesn't kind of fundamentally change lots of the concepts that the models work with. And um, another problem with fine-tuning is that reinforcement learning doesn't, like, aims, attains, aims to maximize reward. It doesn't aim to match a particular representative distribution. Uh, so this is a challenge, right? If we want something like gender parity, when we uh, have a model like this speaking, uh, reinforcement learning is going to uh, still tend to like push the model toward the one thing uh, instead of the other, even if that one thing is only better like 51% of the time or, or uh, slightly better than, than some sort of alternative. So um, one of the like ways, so, so there are multiple like fronts here, right? Like if we're trying to solve this problem of bias, um, we have multiple sub problems to address. And one of the ways to work on these things is like you know doing better data curation or creating better data sets for pre-training. And another way is to try to like make uh, reinforcement learning like uh, less prone to problems of mode collapse when we don't want it to, and more prone to mode collapse when we do want it to, because um, there are instances in which we want one or the other. Uh, are these fundamental problems? Um, the way to address some of these uh, would probably be doing an un involve an unconventional form of RL where you're not just trying to maximize reward all the time uh, because you don't usually get parity out of that. Um, and technical versus fundamental distinction aside, uh, this is something that's going to be a really, really hard challenge, uh, as evidenced by the fact that like we haven't solved it yet and we're not particularly close, but thankfully it's an active area of research. Yeah, it certainly sounds difficult. And I feel like one of the difficulties is just in in thinking about how we even define what is uh, an undesirable versus desirable capability. Um, and that seems like, like it. Who defines it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, I mean, we had a question from, from Daniel who, who asked, you know, what should count as a failure of RLHF rather than an issue that it isn't supposed to address or something that just isn't even a problem? So for example, you know, some people might argue that making these models robust to jailbreaking mm -hmm. per se is actually just making them unresponsive to user desires. and so in a sense, like misaligns to the users. Like, how do we draw those distinctions? Yeah. I think um, uh, with an issue like this, I think the answer might fall out of the context with which we ask the question, mm. right? Um, you, it, it's, a, it's pretty easy to come into instances where there's some sort of problem and it's unclear who to blame, right? Was it the company? Was it the annotator? Uh, was it uh, the curator of pre-trained data? Was it the user? Um, and I think instances where there's a diffusion of responsibility are actually pretty uh, perverse when it comes to you know, uh, correctly uh, attributing uh, blame and addressing problems and holding different parties accountable. But um, at the end of the day, uh, something that can considerably simplify the way that we look at something is that we just don't want bad things to happen, right? So uh, in an instance in which uh, some access to some model is granted, whether it's by a relatively like, closed API or whether it's like, on the other end of the spectrum where the model is open sourced, if something, uh, something goes wrong, if there's a jailbreak that leads to something harmful or if there's a fine tuning run that leads to something harmful, um, that's a failure. And we want mechanisms to like, put barriers to that somewhere, right? So. Um, I don't work on AI governance enough to have like well-formed opinions about where to incis what like how to incisively target specific um, you know parts of the uh, you know pipeline you know pre-training to um, user interactions and everything in between. Um, but the one thing I will say with more confidence is that uh, we, we definitely need this right. And there's a technical front to this challenge, and there's a policy front to this challenge. I might have more to say about this or specific instances of it in office hours, but I'll probably leave it at that. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you were, as you wrapped up, sort of main takeaways from your talk, mentioning that we had this, uh, you know, possible capabilities capture that can, you know, explain why it seems we have this uh, difference in how much RLHF has contributed to capabilities versus versus safety. Um, what do you think made that capabilities capture possible? What made RLHF specifically vulnerable to that? And how can we tell if future alignment methods might have that same vulnerability? Yeah. Um... There is probably a perspective here that's uh, incomplete, but uh, surprisingly uh, has a lot of coverage despite being so simple. And that's that you know, like you know, money and power <laughs> tends to uh, lead to t tends to uh, add instrumental value uh, to uh, capabilities progress. Right? If you want more money and power, it makes sense to uh, uh, generate hype and deploy things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
and a good case study in which this arguably like went pretty wrong, uh, possibly foreseeably, possibly not, we don't know, is like uh, Bing chat or something, mm -hmm. right? And I don't want to like oversimplify this because um, this, it's, this isn't just a story about how like uh, OpenAI, Anthropic, and Google, and Meta, and, and, and Microsoft are like uh, greedy and racing to the bottom. Um, because there are all these other questions to ask about like, you know, our, how do we try to uh, optimally let uh, safety progress keep up with capabilities progress and make sure that capabilities progress is kind of leading at a healthy rate. Um, and how do we learn all of the lessons that we can, right? One of the reasons I can't come up here and say that, like, we should have just slowed things down or we shouldn't have deployed these models is because, um, you know, if we, if we only studied their failures in lab settings, then we would still, we, we would be able to find a lot of them probably, and everything would go slower, but we still wouldn't find as many uh, issues as the internet has collectively found, right? You wouldn't be scrolling through like Twitter or the right subreddits every day and be able to uh, just see problem after problem that some interesting user like uh, found with one of these chatbots or something. So there's a trade-off here, unfortunately. And um, it's probably soon to like, too soon to tell what's going on uh, and then like what's gonna be net positive. But, um, maybe in, as developments continue in the future, you know, we can uh, improve our model of this situation and uh, try to learn as we go and play by ear as the stakes get higher. Yeah. Um, it definitely does seem like it's hard to reason about yeah. alternative futures where labs have taken a different approach in terms of how much of this is happening in-house versus out in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to ask you specifically on the idea of, of transparency. You, know, you mentioned that was one of the things that you were almost surprised to get consensus among your 32 co-authors about um, that transparency is sort of an important aspect of how we move forward. Um, are there, though, any, any downsides of making these models and the ways that they're trained in particular more transparent? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and, and this is one of those frustrating things. Like, you can't, you can't take a, 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 like an easy position on it. There's no, there's no impassioned speech to be made about how one thing should be done or, or one thing shouldn't. It's not like the issue with uh, like uh, mistreatment of knowledge workers, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are downsides to transparency, obviously. We don't want a proliferation all the time, at least, especially unfettered proliferation, right? And giving and disclosing more details about what's kind of done to make systems come to light behind closed doors is going to make things more replicable, uh, you know, in addition to offering proofs of concepts when things come out. So um, we have to figure out some sort of way to at least get close to some kind of optimal balance of, you know, how much information is publicly available about these systems and uh, for the sake of learning valuable lessons versus how much information is publicly available and going to like uh, contribute to more rapid proliferation of capabilities that we might not want, potentially in the hands of people that we don't want them in. And um, the most, the one thing that everyone is, is pretty confident about is that some things should be publicly known, right? A high level view of like, overview of what happened with Sydney or, my, or Bing chat, right? Uh, should be uh, available. Um, potentially sparing a lot of technical details. But some things should be still known outside the company, but probably less publicly. For example, this is one of the most compelling arguments for why we need uh, auditing in the research and dev development ecosystem. Uh, for technical details that if disclosed could lead to proliferation, um, or there's a reasonable chance of this, uh, this is probably when we need to be um, uh, having that information disclosed to trusted auditors uh, instead of the public maybe. And that's a whole other talk and field of research to get into the details about how like an auditing regime should be set up. Um, but it seems to be a, one of the key solutions here um, involving these types of challenges in addition to plenty of other types of challenges. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems pretty clear from what you just said and, and the talk in general that you know, RLHF is not gonna get us all the way there. And in fact, it was never intended, as you point out, to be the you know, paradigmatic alignment solution. Um, we have a, a, a pretty straight to the point question from Daniel, which is just, if RLHF is currently the state of the art alignment method, does that imply that alignment researchers like, like Daniel himself are just really bad at their jobs? <laughs> um, I mean, we might know in like 10 years, I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh, it is the state of the art for alignment and you know, I'm not certain if it should be or not, mm -hmm. but um, uh, definitely the dynamic that led us here is possibly perverse to the extent that it's a capabilities capture, right? And let's see, what else do I have to say about this? Um, have we failed as an alignment community? Um, well, some people in the alignment community are wrong, for sure. Um, and I don't know who, 
but there's definitely kind of like a divergence that's starting to happen here. And this might be a, a good point to kind of like uh, start to wrap up on because uh, we now have a spectrum of opinions ranging from like pause and stop AI versus, you know, like keep capabilities proceeding at a relatively rapid pace for techno optimist uh, reasons. And we're all part of the same semi dysfunctional community. And uh, we all are doing our best, but we have these differing opinions here. And it's probably going to turn about, well, it's, it has to turn out that um, we may never know, but like counterfactually, one of these positions is going to be better than the other. Um, and the real solution is probably somewhere that's not like the most extreme positions, uh, persons and a uh, position on either end, right? So someone in the alignment failure is wrong. I might be very wrong on, on certain things, I probably am. Um, and it seems like a pretty high value uh, question to work on, uh, to uh, do our best to uh, you know, learn from the next chapter uh, as quickly as we can, like who is wrong, and to try to like accumulate evidence and perspectives on the value of certain types of progress and the risks certain types of progress. I think that's a, a great note to end on. So uh, please join me one more time in thanking Cass and then join us in office hours in 308 afterwards. Right. Thanks everyone. Thanks Eric.